Hey guys, I'm Fancy and this is Murder by Design. And my partner Colleen is not here tonight. She's just a little under the weather. So um, it'll just be me, but I do have a very special guest tonight. So we are super, super honored to have our guest. What the heck is going on? Oh, 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 I'm hearing it in my, I'm sorry guys, I was hearing it because the YouTube was open. <laughs> Well, we have a very, we're very honored tonight to have our guest. It's Dr. Katherine Ramslin. She's written over 68 books in the realm of crime, forensic science, and supernatural, as well as over 1,000 articles. We're going to be talking about her book, Confessions of a Serial Killer, uh, about BTK. And she actually is the executive producer of Murder House Flip. So we're going to talk about that a little later, too, because I'm super excited about that show. So anyway, Catherine, can you tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Okay, I um, teach forensic psychology at DeSales University where I am also the assistant provost. And I also do an adjunct um, class right now on homicidal offenders at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So when I'm not doing that, I'm writing and I write a lot. <laughs> I write all the time, I write, so that's how I got all these books. And uh, I'm also in a Master of Fine Arts program as a student, again, on top of all of that, because I'm wanting to improve my writing. So the, the most important thing, I guess, in my life is writing, research. Um, I've become a serial killer expert or an expert of um, extreme offenders, because now it's also spree killers and mass murderers, too. So I do most of that, and I also um, consult with coroners on death investigations in particular for uh, suicides. So I, so I do a lot of things and all of them are highly interesting. Yes, they are. Have you ever worked with um, Joseph Scott Morgan? No, I know him. I, I haven't worked with him. Ah, I was just thinking, you know, he's one of the, or was one of the leading death investigators in the, in the country. So, and he's one of our guests all the time. We just love him to death. But we always end up like two and a half hours when we talk to him. We always say, oh, it's only going to be 30 minutes. And then it's two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to work with the people who are local to me because uh, yeah. we go over those cases. Right, right. So what led you to like forensic psych psychology? And can you tell our viewers exactly what forensic psychology is? Okay. Well, my path to it is circuitous for sure. It's not something I aspired to do. But forensic psychology is anywhere the legal and investigative system intersects with psychology, anything from psychology, clinical, cognitive, social psychology, um, all of that kind of stuff where it comes into the courts or um, it's important for investigations, a forensic psychologist would cover those areas. So that could be prisons, it could be victims groups, it could be expert witnesses, um, examinations for competency and insanity, consulting and death investigations, which is what I primarily do, training police officers in things like, you know, observation skills and cognitive quirks. I do a lot of that. I train, I also train attorneys. So really any, any time you need some kind of expertise from the field of psychology in the legal or investigative system, you have uh, forensic psychology. It overlaps with criminology, but they are not the same thing. Oh, wow. So what is the difference between forensic psychology and criminology? Well, criminology tends to be more about trends and what causes crime, you know, um, <laughs> whereas forensic psychology, especially the oh, clinical aspects, really? tend to be more about cases and, and really looking at um, the details okay. of a person's developmental trajectory, for example. So you might look at a, a population base in criminology for you know the, the potential for for crime rates, but you'll take a case like Edmund Kemper, as you mentioned, and look at you know how did he get to the point where he's at fifteen murdering his grandparents and then goes on and and kills young women and then his mother. So where did he? How did he get there? That's forensic psychology. I see. I see. That's kind of like what we like to talk about here. I'm obviously, I'm not a forensic psychologist by any means, but I do, um, I do think that I kind of look into a lot of the, that kind of stuff. Um, that's how we came about this channel specifically. Now our podcast is, you know, more general case stuff, but here we like to try and look into like the minds of 
serial killers, um, what causes a person to do what they're doing, you know, what was in their background, did they have anything in their background, you know, that's kind of what we like to look at here. So, um, so were you into crime, like as a teenager or as a kid, or did it just kind of happen later in life for you? Well, I wasn't into crime, um, but there was a serial killer operating in my hometown. Um, and I was, and he was picking up young girls on his motorcycle. And I was actually hitchhiking at a place where he picked a girl up the next day who looked very much like me. So, and I'm actually fr kind of friends with him. We've been corresponding for well over two decades. Um, he's in prison. So I guess for me, that was my first kind of sense of it. Uh, it didn't really launch me into true crime, but it did make me interested in a person like that. Um, mm -hmm. And and this is way before, you know, a lot of, we, we have a lot of popularity of all of this right now. At the time I was getting into it, it, it was considered the, the thing to avoid if you wanted to be a writer because you're never going to sell books and, you know, how, how things mm -hmm. have changed. Let me just say that. But what, mm -hmm. what I was interested in really was what made a person this way. And I began writing for the Core TV web, website. And they, mm -hmm. they kind of just sort of threw all the serial killer cases to me and the forensic oh, science yeah. and psychology cases. So I ended up writing something about like 225 stories for them, each of which was 10 to 12,000 words long. So through all wow. that, you become an expert pretty quickly. Um, and then book deals came, you know, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. CSI jumped in into the scene and, you know, changed the entire landscape of true crime and, and what fascinated people with it. So it kind of got swept up into it. I, I'll tell mm -hmm. you, truthfully, I start, I really started as a philosophy professor. I did that oh, at Rutgers for 15 years before I ever did any of this. So wow. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was, and actually, frankly, I was never going to go to college at all when I was 18. <laughs> And it took three years before I did, but now I'm working on my fifth graduate degree. So things change. Wow. 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 That is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. That's so funny. Um, you know, I, I did, I started off in philosophy and um, psychology when I went to um, college at first and ended up in, you know, obviously I'm a um, entertainment person. So, um, you know, I was actress, a writer, a producer. So, um, I ended up, you know, doing a fine arts degree, but uh, um, I really enjoyed the psychological stuff. And so I've always like tried to um, grab textbooks on it and like teach myself stuff, you know, so. Um, but but anyway, yesterday I was talking about um, BTK and just if you guys didn't get a chance to watch it, uh, just a little bit about Dennis is Dennis Rader. He began um, his tirade of murders in 1974. Um, he stalked and killed a family of four. And he was fascinated with binding and torturing his victims before murdering him, leading them to later be called the bind, bind torture kill killer or BTK for short. And over the years, he juggled being a family man and a murderer, and he has been attached to 10 murders, but some believe there were more. And in 2005, he got caught in a game of sorts with the police, sending them messages and et cetera. And he was caught and tried for murder and for the 10 murders. So, you dealt with him a lot. So was there anything in Raider's past that would lead him to this kind of propensity for binding and torturing his victims before killing them? Or is that just something that he randomly picked up? Well, I mean, I wrote a whole book. That's a little <laughs> so right, hard to right, 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 right. I can't give it to you in a succinct uh, way. But basically, let me just tell you, first of all, Raider named himself. That that came out right. of him him telling police that's the name he wanted. Right. Um, I got to know him about 10 years ago. We spent five of those years working very hard on his, what I call his guided autobiography, because I guided him toward the kind of information that would be beneficial to forensic psychology, criminology, and law enforcement. So there, the, it wasn't just a serial killer blathering on about himself. It was you know, very, very uh, structured in a way to get him thinking about certain things that he himself would not have thought of on his own. Um, but then of course, a lot of it had to do with who he was as a child, 
he, and he turns out to be pretty unique. He, he was an all American boy with an intact family and both sets of grandparents. And he grew up on, on farms before they moved to Wichita. You know, his father had been in the, in the military, but then came home and everything seems absolutely normal, Midwest, basic boy stuff, cowboys and Indians, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But in the back of his mind, um, there were things working on him in terms of, uh, he, he felt very off balance with, with females. Um, and he didn't like that. He, he really hated that, in fact. Um, so this is not a guy who has your typical things. He, he, he did some cruelty with cats, mostly because his grandmother hated cats, but he didn't really have that, that kind of streak in him and he didn't set fires and wet beds and you know, all the mm -hmm. stuff that people think are right. precursors to serial murder, which they're not at all. That's, t that's mm -hmm. one of the worst um, misconceptions of serial murder out there. At any rate, with, with Raider, he began to, first of all, have this anger against uh, females in part because his mother humiliated him a few times. Um, and he just, he just didn't, he felt out of control, which he didn't like. He was the oldest boy of four in his family. He liked the idea that he was in charge and yet he was getting bad grades, mostly female teachers. So he felt under their power. And so he began to, to have these ideas of trapping women, girl traps, things like that. Um, and then when he was, I think, 14, the um, clutter murders happened in Kansas that, in cold blood. They happened in Kansas about 200 miles to the west of, of Wichita. And he was in a car that night with a, with a girl that he had a crush on. And he, he came over the radio and he immediately wanted to, you know, bind her and kill her. So that was his response. It excited him. He also had been reading some true detective magazines. Anyone who thinks those magazines didn't have any influence on people don't, don't, have no idea. Uh, they, were, right. they were absolutely salacious. They were you know, as near to pornography in those days as you could get. And he got a hold of a cop, some copies his father had. And one was the H.H. H. Holmes story, and one was the Harvey Glattman story. And Glattman bound his victims, took pictures of them, told them he was going to kill them. And that, that look on the face of these young women that did end up dead um, just transfixed Dennis. And he wanted to duplicate that in the face of, of a woman too, like in that Funicello of the Mouseketeers. <laughs> so, so all of these influences sort of braided together to wow. you know, become murder fantasies and these now we say he started in 1974, but did he, he carried a, a hit kit when he was in the military overseas? Right. Really? Did he never use it? You know, he says no. Can we believe that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no. How do you believe the word of a serial? Well, right. They they lie. Serial killer, right? <laughs> so. But I, but the thing with Raider is. Yeah. No, I they lie. Know. They even I didn't. they even take they even. Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't just take. I mean, he wasn't just talking to me. I also had five years of letters he had written to another person who had wanted to write a book with him and then handed it off to me. I had the, the entire police interrogation. I had the DA's files because she was a friend of mine. Um, I had letters from other people. So I had a number of ways into him so that I could pretty easily right. catch him out in lies and, and did a few times and he got pretty upset with me. But also, he's a narcissist, so he wants to make sure he gets the fame, you know, that he thinks is coming to him. And so, he, yeah. you know, he wasn't going to turn me away because this, the families, the victims' families who get the proceeds of this book, um, they really had approved me and they had not approved anyone else. So it wasn't like this was going to be an avenue for him in any other way. So in a way, he was stuck with me. We get along well. I mean, I mean, five years is a very intense time to be working on someone's life story. Um, yes, and we yes. still continue to, you know, communicate and uh, work on things. But so that's that's my experience with the BTK serial killer. It was intense, um, and I don't know that I'd want to ever do another one quite that involved. 
Yeah, we, we feel the same way. We we spent four years working on the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case um, and everything was fantastic until, like you said, we began to catch lies and mistruths. And we had everything just like like what you're talking about. You know, we had all the medical files that nobody's ever seen, not even the not even her defense attorney or Gypsy um, because she signed for us to have them. You know, so we contacted the, the places and got them. And, and of course, we intend to give her copies of those, you know, later. But once we started uncovering things that didn't jive with what her story and her parents' story was, they turned on us very quickly. And same thing, I don't think we'd ever want to go that deep into, and I'm writing a book, you know, we're all working on it, but I'm, I'm the actual writer on it. And um, I don't think I'd ever want to go that deep again, or at least not get that close to them because it was heartbreaking when um, it turned, you know, yeah. it just really killed all of us. We were very, very, very heartbroken and it took a very long time for us to get over that. So, um, well, I actually wouldn't mind if that happens. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I approached it more clinically than passionately. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's only, I don't know how much further I want to take it. So take it. Right. Yeah. So I did read that you and Raider developed like a sort of code. So he was able to like freely talk about his victims, fantasies, and ultimately what led him to commit these murders. So can you tell us a little bit about how you guys developed that and maybe give us some like some insight into it? Because I've never heard of that being done before. So yeah. And again, he's unique. So right. one of the right. things Raider thought about himself is that he's kind of like a spy. So mm -hmm. when people yes, wanted to, to talk with him, they had to agree to use codes. Part of that was practical because he didn't want the, the guards in the prison to know what he was saying to people. And mm -hmm. part of it was to see how far you would go with him in the game. And of course, I'm going to go in the game. But the interesting thing was, you know, the, and this whole first chapter is about the formation of this code because, you know, mm -hmm. he sent me half and he sent the other woman who had the, the five years worth of letters that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, he said her, her half of the code and we had to kind of put it together, but he had forgotten some of it. So it, we couldn't quite <laughs> get it to work. And so finally I said, uh, I'll make the code. So, here, so here's an interesting thing. If you think, listen to the irony of this, he doesn't want a woman in charge, correct? Yet I'm the one who's got all the power. And also I'm making the code. And I made the code in a way that I knew would appeal to him because I knew the things that he really liked, like the number three and, you know, and there were certain other kinds of, of imagery things he liked. So I created the code uh, with all of that. And that's what we used for the book. So that was the interesting part is that he started with his to make me fall into line and we ended up using mine. Now, I, don't, I don't think he himself recognized the twist in that, but no, it was no. ironic to me. I would bet that he didn't recognize that twist. <laughs> um, so now what is his fascination with the number three? Where does that come from? Yeah, he has this idea that three is magical in some way. And so everything, everything essentially he reads through the number three. There was some movie, um, I'm trying to think what it, it starred. Um, oh, he used to be a comedian and then he became a serious actor. I'm trying to think who it was. Are you thinking of numbers? Yeah, that's it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Numbers. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah, so he that. got kind of caught up in this idea that three has some magical quality. For example, my birthday is, is January 2nd, so one, two. Well, he wanted to trade yeah. birthdays because. You know, I have the one and the two makes three. <laughs> oh, he'd like mine. You know, he'd like he, mine because mine is January twenty first. <laughs> yeah, well, and he also, his is his is in March, so he's got the number three in the month there. But you know, so he looks at everything like events that happen. He'll he'll go. Do you see? Do you see the three in that? And when when he was um, stalking victims, he always looked for number three in the address or some permutation of three. It could be a six or nine wow. or two things like one and two that make three. It, it always well, had to add in some way to three. He obviously must have watched a lot of Sesame Street because I remember three is a magic number from Sesame Street. <laughs> I don't think he ever watched Sesame Street. That's so funny because I'm serious. That that there was like a little song and they played it. It's like three 
is a magic number. Maybe it was, no, maybe not, maybe it's not Sesame Street. Maybe it's the um, Schoolhouse Rocks. Like, um, that's what I think it is. It's Schoolhouse Rock, actually. So he must yeah, have that, his, his number three thing went earlier than any of those shows, but he's not the only uh, person to have thought that. But he, yeah, but he right, really right. does view the world through it. Right? So he's That's constantly so reminding me of it. That is kind of crazy. So guys, just so you know, if you're just tuning in, we're talking with Catherine um, Ramslin, and she is an author of over 68 books. Not sure what happened, but you're you're frozen. I don't hear you. Okay, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so just letting you guys know, if you're just tuning in, we are talking with Catherine Ramslin, author of 68 Books in the Realms of Crime, Forensic Science, and the Supernatural. We're mostly talking about her book, Confessions of a Serial Killer, that's all about the B2K killer, which is Dennis Rader. So, um, so we also talked about him referring to a bad side as the Minotaur. And it was this entity that he claims did the Killings and a little bit about this compartmentalism because it is something that we've seen in a couple of the cases that we've looked at, like Golden State Killer and the Son of Sam and Nicholas Godijohn, where they create like um, you know these several others that, that kind of create these different personalities and say that they're the ones that committed the murders. Nope. Um, no, it's not Raider. In fact, he doesn't even he doesn't even his concept is even better than this idea of compartmentalizing. He calls okay. it. Cute. And so if you imagine a, cube, a cubing, so if you oh, imagine okay. a cube, the mm -hmm. person is all sides of that cube, but on, on each of the sides could be like serial killer on one side, family man on another, church president on another, thief on another. So he can switch around on the cube for whatever he needs at any given context, which I think actually is a lot better concept than compartmentalizing. But at no point did he say, you know, there was, a, there was a very short period of time he talked about being possessed by a demon, and that was mostly because his minister suggested it to him uh, very early after he got arrested, but that's not what he mm -hmm. really thought. And so the what minotaur, was this minotar? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What is, the is any serial killer. That's just a term he uses as part of his code. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So it's part of that code that he came up with. I get it. Right. Um, that's interesting. Um, but we, I mean, I have seen a lot of them do this where they, uh, it's almost as if, uh, by, by, and I like your idea. I like the idea of cubing. That is neat because, you know, they can be all different things, but we've seen this in several other ones that we've, that we've worked with, like Nicholas Godijohn. He, uh, you know, claimed that he had a 500, uh, 500 year old vampire inside of him, that he's the one that did everything else. But Nicholas was yeah. like the good guy, you know? Um, yeah, I just yeah. Danny Rowling said Gemini. You know, right. Yeah. So and what John is the reasoning the for that? And do you just do you just believe that that's like something that they're doing to kind of rationalize it to themselves, and so they no, don't have to admit cool. to it? Or what do you think no, it's, it's it really pose. is? They're just doing it. Pose. pose. Right. Right. They heard so just another. Else. They heard it from right. some. It's it's the same thing from one to another. They all have the same thing. So it gets mm -hmm. passed around prisons and stuff. Um, right. The, the idea of a 500 year old vampire is the same thing as Rowling, Rollins with uh, with his Gemini, which he got out of out of Exorcist three. Right. Um, John, John Wayne Gacy had John Hanley, Jack Hanley, that he mm -hmm. blamed, and that was his preparation mm -hmm. for the insanity defense. And almost right. always, it's a pose. It is right. just a ruse. Yes, a pose. Ruse. Right, right, exactly. No. Like Berkowitz, they, they Berkowitz believe. blamed his dog, you know, like. It, and he, and, and very quickly said, it, he made that up. Right, 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 right. It no, can be Murphy, the hillside strangler, also malingered, right. um, you know, multiple personality disorder and then got caught right. out. Right. So it's just, it's just something that they use because they've read about it mm -hmm. and, and they think, mm -hmm. and it's easy to fake. It's very easy to fake. They've yes. read about it, so they use mm -hmm. it, and, and people are fooled right. by it. So, right, they, right. It's fun for them. They have nothing to lose. But I've never, I've never seen a genuine case of it among serial no. killers. 
No, no, I haven't either. Um, fighting with crime 247. Um, no, it's not like multiple personalities. They're claiming multiple personalities in many cases, but it's like she's saying, it's a ruse. It's something that they're doing. Um, like with Nicholas, it was his way of saying, oh, no, no, it, it's not me. So he didn't have to be judged. So if he said something that was strange or whatever, then he'd just blame it on another personality. Well, he did the same thing with killing Dee Dee. He blamed it on this, you know, Victor. And it's Victor that did it, not me. I'm a good guy. That's that's Victor. That's not him, you know. So there it's is multiple. Wayne there Gacy. is right. John Wayne Gacy, same thing. Right, Ed Kemper. Right. Like, so it's something he blacked out and he didn't know what right. was going on mm -hmm. with somebody else. But there is, there is actually, you know, multiple personality disorder. But that's not what these guys are doing. That it's not. That is not it. You know. Um, and I'm sure that there is somebody who does kill that way as somewhere. But it, this is not these guys these guys are claiming it to either get out of it or you know make themselves not look so bad to others it's 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 a, a way to you know keep from having to you know admit to something so um it's not like that at all so um in Rolling Stone, they wrote that these murders were the climax to his sexual fantasies. Can you tell us what he was doing with the clippings from the magazine and what exactly were these motel parties? And also, if I'm not mistaken, he never like sexually assaulted any of his victims. So if that was a sexual release for him, why didn't he do that to them? He, he sexually molested Josephine Otero. Okay, okay so he did do that. This 13 or 11 year old, they hanged her from a, you know, a beam in the basement and masturbated mm -hmm. on her. Doesn't right. matter if he penetrated her, he molested Church. her. Yes. Oh, so yes. absolutely he did that. Mm -hmm. um, he, he took one woman after he murdered her out of her home and posed her in underwear that he had stolen out of other homes. I would call that molestation. Okay. Um, it yeah. Doesn't matter if he's raping them. He is certainly molesting them in a sexual manner. Right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Exactly. Okay. So, what was he doing with those clippings from the magazine, or what are motel parties? Well, the clippings from the magazine are his slick ad girls, and he he had hundreds of them. He would name them and give them a little story and take them with him to work. He, he puts a you know slick ad girl name. Diane or Daisy or whatever, mm -hmm. and he'd talk to her while he was driving around in his you know, work truck or something like that. Uh, they were fantasy girls, basically. He still has them. He's made some for me while he's been in prison. Um, they, they're just the way to, for him to ground a fantasy in, in uh, what a magazine girl looks like. And I'll tell you one thing about Raider. He's, he's not very original. Most of his ideas came from novels or true crime books or uh you know getting the magazine girls he he, he doesn't really have the uh, an ability to just kind of fantasize somebody out of thin air he's got to have some pattern set for him by somebody else uh, yeah. i've found that almost everything that he comes up with is a copy of somebody so he's kind of in that way because he wanted to copy hh right. holmes in his fantasy life he wanted to copy Harvey Glattman and Ted Bundy and, you know, he paid attention to the killers who would strangle because that was the method that he used. The Boston Strangler was another one, the Hillside right. Stranglers. Mm -hmm. you know, Hillside Stranglers another, yeah. He didn't really care much about someone like the Zodiac because he shot his victims or, although right. he, did, he did find a couple. Um, but mostly Raider looked at the ones that he could copy from. So he, he's not a very original kind of person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sick ad girls were just something to entertain himself with. The motel mm -hmm. parties, when he was on the road for various uh, jobs, like he was a census worker for a while, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he would he would then gather up all these these various sexual paraphernalias uh, into his kid. He'd go shopping in hardware stores and things like that to make to make more. And then he'd mm -hmm. masturbate with Barbie dolls and things like that. He, at one point, he had read that a serial killer had a, a dry cleaning bag that he mm -hmm. put victims in. So Raider got some kind of Barbie doll in, in, in one of these bags and got into it with her. This is all fantasy, but he, wow. but he had all these bizarre things mm -hmm. to do it with. And he always loved going out of town because he didn't have to check in with his wife and kids. And he right. had all the time in the world 
to do these. So he called them motel parties because it was his way to be away from home and right. indulge himself. About, yeah, and about these fantasies, right. Now, yeah. you said uh, he didn't really care a lot about Zodiac, but I wonder, and, and this could be totally, because I can't remember exactly the dates of when both of them were doing things. So did Zodiac came first, right? I, 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 if I uh, Zodiac right. came first and the Raider was overseas in the military. There are people who say he's the Zodiac killer, that he got oh, on a plane somehow and flew back just in time to commit these murders. And oh that. my gosh. Everybody <laughs> tries to say Zodiac is somebody. I have people that say that yeah. Zodiac is Golden State Killer. I just, it's yeah. crazy. But what I was thinking about that maybe he took from Zodiac was um, not um, uh, the code kind of idea and um, yes. maybe possibly the taunting of the police because Zodiac did the same thing, you know? So maybe that's something that he took from Zodiac. Well, he you know? took, so. he took the, the idea of a ruse where he, right. he told, uh, you know, potential victims mm -hmm. that he was just a fugitive right. on the road. He took that. Mm -hmm. He took, uh, there, you know, he, there are a couple, he, he'll say he didn't pay any attention, but I, I'll be able to show, you know, yes, this is what Zodiac did. I, I know that you read you read the accounts. I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. But does that right. make him the Zodiac? The thing about why he's not the Zodiac is he wants fame. Why wouldn't right. he take credit? He's got nothing to right. lose. So right. like California's right. death penalty means anything, as we just found out this week. So right. would right. it, it, that would make him the most famous serial killer in the world. <laughs> right so yeah like all infinite power you know? <laughs> well, someone told me the reason he won't say he's a zodiac is because he's afraid for his soul I'm like okay no he's not he's actually not <laughs> so. right 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 so i know that you worked with him directly um did you ever just sit across the table and see a normal person or was it always yes. this kind of evilness in him he's not, no he's not you and almost never are they evil. Right. Right. From them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're evil for the people they're going to kill or harm sure. someone, torture. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who see the evilness in them. Right. right. They're ordinarily just, and he was a, just a completely ordinary person. Um, he, right. When I was, was at the prison, you know, he'd be like, oh, how was your trip? You know, the things you talk about. And, and I, and uh -huh. I actually found being at the prison the least beneficial to the book because the guards would hang out, you uh -huh. know, and, and you're not even face to face so much. You're in booths where you have to use a monitor because he's in maximum security. Right. So you don't even get what you see on TV, you know, the glass thing, but you don't get that either. Um, right. But the guards would be on his side, they'd be on my side. <laughs> like, Mm -hmm. You can't talk here. There's no way to get right. anything done here. So mm -hmm. that was really not a very effective way of approaching this. But, you know, I sure. did it. Most of our conversations are on the phone and usually at, right. like an hour at a time. And we probably did most of our work that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what conclusions about him did you draw from the time you worked with him? And what is this factor X? Well, Factor X, he did challenge me because uh, to, to him, that's the mystery that resides in all serial killers and it's different for each one. And he's right. That is exactly right. What, what motivates and drives them is mm -hmm. within their own individual development. But um, his Factor X wasn't difficult. It's, a, it's really a, braid of, a braiding of three factors. Control over mm -hmm. women because he hated that. Humiliation. Mm -hmm. The need to be famous, you know, was was oh, one no, of the driving um, and please. his his bondage paraphilia. What's wrong with this, Catherine? Are you there? Yes, I am. Are you, can, can you, you hear me? me? I can hear you. We've I can hear you. Storms and so nothing she is saying is coming through. Oh, there you are. There okay. you are. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Because I'm no. sorry. We're having storms. <laughs> so we're having storms coming through. So my other. Where are you? Stupid. I am in Kentucky. Oh. So we're having huge, awful storms right now rolling through. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Factor X basically is is the things that most affected him were he wanted right. control over women. He wanted to be mm -hmm. famous, and he had these fantasies of bondage and domination. Mm -hmm. So the three of them weave together to to show what compels him and what did compel him 
in each of his murders. Wow. Um, and did I know you said, you know, that he had some fantasies and things about the bind and torture and he kind of picked it up from other serial killers. But did you ever find anything like deeper about that or it was just something that he just he just took from another person and kind of put it into his his No, fantasies? I mean, it, it, the bondage really came from the, the games he played as a boy when when mm. the cowboys and Indians, they'd bind, you know, they'd tie each other mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and he started yes. to find it erotic. Okay. And so you're always looking at where does the eroticism come from? It's always just yes. as they're becoming, you're going into puberty, they're becoming, mm -hmm. you know, young, young males that, mm -hmm. that are sexual beings and the kinds of things that get paired with that process become, uh, often become paraphilias. Now, not all paraphilias are criminal. In fact, most are not. But those that mm -hmm. become coercive, that require harm to others or trespass on others' rights, those, be, those are coercive paraphilias and they do get into the realm of criminality. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, any kind of sexual sadism or need to torture or bind or mm -hmm. you know, kill somebody in order to get, mm -hmm. you know, to be aroused and to get excited and to have a climax, that's, that's a coercive paraphilia. So right. that's what he developed and it really went back to binding and he began to, in private, tie ropes around his waist and mm -hmm. cut off his own air. So hypoxia sets in. I, you know, I do think he probably had some amount of brain damage because he had, there were three times when he had head injuries. And he also had these hypoxic events where oxygen was taken from his brain because he, he would tie mm -hmm. these ropes around himself for erotic purposes to the mm -hmm. point almost of passing out. So he did some damage to himself at very young, but it was an erotic thing and it became a permanently mm -hmm. erotic thing. Right. Um, so you talk about the front, the, the um, head damage. Uh, that's something that happened with uh, Dahmer as well. Um, but I was reading something the other day in a psychology thing that said that most serial killers have some sort of frontal lobe damage or trauma before the age of 21. Is that, well, is that true? It is not true. That's a very old study. I don't even know where they got that one from. It's a very old study and it's not true. We don't do not. Have, we have thousands of serial killers. Around I know, the world. right? Honestly, right. and right. and often, you know what happened is when the when the FBI profilers, the behavioral science unit before it was a behavioral analysis unit, you know they right. went around to these prison interviews, which were not mm -hmm. randomly sampled by any stretch of the imagination. And a very small right. sample of the thirty six was only twenty five serial killers. But out of that, they generated these articles. And that's where the McDonald triad, you know, where they thought the bed right. wedding, all of that, and they were not correct. And even in their calculations on that small sample, wasn't even right. the majority of people who had those three. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we got these myths about serial killers out of some of these early non-randomized samples <laughs> and claims made because it was the FBI agents who were writing and publishing papers and unfortunately mm -hmm. they became sort of the basis of what we think about serial killers. It takes right. me a long time uh, in my class on extreme offenders to disabuse my students of some of these myths. These you know, myths. I, I right. have a list of 20 and I just go through, you think you know, <laughs> there is no re research support for a great many of these things, but the claims are out there in the media. So they think <laughs> they're true and that is one of them. Well, maybe we'll have to have you back on to tell us about those 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know you were saying, you know, some of the FBI profilers, you know, went around and made did these studies. One of those was John Douglas. And so you actually helped him write um, or gave him some information about writing the cases that haunt us. What was it like working Who's with John? Because everybody knows that. him. I did the huh? research. I did the right. research on that book. And right, right. Um, you know, and then what we do, uh, Mark Olshaker was the writer and John was, was the, a, the FBI agent. So right. we'd get together and we'd order a pizza and I'd bring in the research and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, John would write it. and I mean, Mark would write it and John would talk about what, you know, how he's profiling that particular crime. So of those cases, mm -hmm. things like the Black Dahlia was one of them, Lizzie Borden. I went over and I spent the night in the Lizzie Borden house all by myself. Oh, so that's so wonderful. <laughs> that was amazing. I am, I am so, like seriously obsessed with Lizzie Borden. Like that is something. I, you should go. 
Although it's not like it was when I went, it was yeah. you know, right now they've made it into a more of a circus. Mm-hmm. When I, when I went the, it was a bed and breakfast, but I was able to stay right. there all by myself because nobody else had booked that night. And wow. it was more, more serious atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And so I did the research for, for John Douglas in, in town, in the museum mm-hmm. and the cemetery and all the various places. And then I did some ghost research at the same time for my own book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wow, that is so so cool. But yeah, I worked with John for that, on that book. And, you know, it was really sort of my introduction into behavior profiling. That was, that was like, you know, in the 1990s. So Right, right, right. So my obsession with Lizzie Borden goes way back. Like, and, and this is probably me sharing like something that people are going to be like, oh my God, she's such a weirdo. But when I was in like fifth and sixth grade, there was these girls that I hung out with and we all like pretended that we were Lizzie Borden's sisters for some reason. Like, and we would do like a whole like show about it. Like, you know, we were all like just acting, but we were making up like all kinds of like characteristic things that happened and how Lizzie did stuff. And it was just so, so weird. You know like, what? Uh, Maple Croft is for sale right now. Eight hundred ninety thousand dollars. You should buy it. That's where she lived. I, the five years I, of def- I definitely should. That's so funny. <laughs> well, talking about property. So we, I said earlier in this show that you are the exec, one of the executive producers of Murder House Flip. So let's talk about that. Tell me about that show. How did you kind of come up with the idea, and what do you guys got planned for coming upcoming stuff? The idea for Murder House Flip came from when I was teaching a course, um, my Extreme Offenders course, and I was talking about a triple homicide in our town, in in uh, the area where I live in Pennsylvania. And one of my students drove by the house and said, it's for sale. Mm -hmm. At the very same time, I had already once pitched a show to CBS and they bought it in the room, but then the economy tanked. So I already had some connections with Sony and and Josh Mm -hmm. Berman, who's a former executive producer of CSI, who I met on a a writer's cruise to Alaska, but that's another story. (laughs) Everything's about connections. So right. he, at that time, he said, do you have any, any ideas? And I sent him a list. And at the bottom of the list, I put Murder House Flip as a funny. I just thought he'd laugh. <laughs> and he immediately ignored everything else I sent and said, give me a treatment <laughs> on that. And that was, I guess, three, almost four, yeah, four years ago now. Wow. So, it, so I gave, you know, I, I came up with many, many murder houses that could be explored. Now, this is initially we had this idea that we were going to buy them and flip them, but we click, right. quickly realized we're, we are going to buy all these houses and keep them in, you know, on the chance that somebody's going to buy them back from us. So right. it became more of a murder house makeover show. Uh-huh. And we went around pitching. I mean, it was, it was very exotic to me to run around Hollywood pitching to. You know, HBO and Showtime and ABC right. and all the all these places. It was really fun. I didn't think anything would come of it, but it was really great. T- I had a great time. Right. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we had ups and downs, ups and downs for three years is yes. how long we ended up pitching. I've and been then, there, done that. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, Quibi started up and mm-hmm. Sony had an association with with them, so Quick Bites is what the you know it's a streaming service. Right. Quick Bites. Mm-hmm. So we just happened to get in the door as they were looking at stuff, and they thought, "Wow!" And Steven Steven Spielberg actually was aware of our concept, which you know, and everybody thought that, "Wow, this is going to be huge or terrible, one or the other." <laughs> 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 We got, well, you we got, got a second season, so I'm going to say maybe huge. <laughs> well, we got incredible PR around the world before the, right. it, it even took off because people yeah. thought the concept was so unique. And it yet, is. why hadn't anyone ever done it before? Because it's also so obvious. But right. this, the, essentially, the, the idea is that you take a house that had a murder or several mm-hmm. murders, as in the case of Dorothy Puente, Right. And you heal the space where that happened. Oh, that's so amazing. And I'm going to tell you, they get such incredible makeovers that I'm afraid we're going to inspire murders because people will want oh, that makeover. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Amazing well, makeovers. It's, right. you know, it's fun because it's with Quibi, you get like five to six minute chunks. 
So right. each house is three. Uh, you mm -hmm. get the crime with all the you know, right stuff Formation. involved. You get right. the the designers talk about what can we do to redo this. Right. Sometimes it's those stories involved as well. And then mm -hmm. finally you get the reveal of all the amazing things they did to the house and how the right. homeowners feel about it. So we took the first season was four houses. We are mm -hmm. in second season now collecting our, our various houses and, and mm -hmm. pitching them again to Quibi. So we'll have a second season. We have enough for a third season if it comes to that. So mm -hmm. it's very exciting for me because I get to be, you know, one of we, there's three of us who are executive producers and we get to look at all the casting tapes and all, all this stuff. It's just yeah. really fun for me because, because you know, I, I just never dreamed this something like this could happen. And it's been a blast to, to be part of it. It's really been amazing. Yeah. Um, so fun fact, when I was, I think I was 22 or 23, I, cause I'd had my first daughter at this time. My, my, my best friend and I, um, who I consider like a sister, we were both real estate agents and, uh, one of the company, one of the agencies that we worked for did a lot of with HUD houses. And so we were going to show this fake God, we went to go look at it before we um, made the appointment for the person to come look at it because it was everything they wanted, neighborhood they wanted, nice outside, you know, looking house, nowhere on the MLS system, nowhere in the HUD, like anything, said anything about something happening inside this house. So I get it, you know, we've got the block box, we put the code in, we both walk through the door and immediately it, we are hit with like the most awful smell ever and oh. the walls are just covered in blood and there's like matter you know, like brain matter and everything all over this living room and nobody was prepared for this my best friend and i both ran out and i you know we're puking in the bushes and uh i'm like in tears and i'm not normally affected by that but when you get up and close personal with that and you're not expecting that that is freaking crazy. And it was the most horrifying, horrifying, weird, interesting day of my life. Like, you know, because then we went and tried to find out what happened, you know, cause we, cause we were true crime buffs. So, you know, we went and found out that, um, it was a guy who, um, had murdered his wife, you know, and, um, HUD took care, you know, took over the home and they, they hadn't cleaned it yet. They literally yeah. had not sent in cleaners yet. And they had it listed, and it's like, are you guys kidding me with this? <laughs> like, we had it. We had the house that we still found blood in when we were doing the makeover. Where they pulled up the floor, and there it was. Well, this was like, I mean, as if the murder scene had just happened. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was that intense. I, I, like, I'm talking literally brain matter on the walls and, yeah. and blood running down. It was. I mean, it had to have been a very brutal murder. Whatever happened, you know. I mean, it was bad. So. Well, where can people well, Isn't that find something you want to be, didn't, don't you think you want to have that experience if you're a true crime person? Yes, right? yes, actually, yes. But I would like to know about it before I walk into it. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen that now. I've gone and seen things like that now, but at 22 and not thinking about it. And I actually think, you know what? I think I was pregnant with my second daughter at the time too. So that oh. was probably another reaction all of itself, you know, but um I went in, it just, it was crazy. But like I said, we, we were fascinated by it afterwards. We were like, well, how do you, how does this happen? Who is it? What is this house? You know? So that was interesting, you know, and found out all about it, but, but it was crazy, but you know, I, I've never had that experience. <laughs> that was a very strange yeah. experience. Like, yeah. you know, I've Absolutely. been to crime scenes before and I've, you know, been to different things like that, but definitely that one was a crazy moment. <laughs> yes. And I was not expecting it in any way, shape, or form. I think if I'd been prepared, it would have been fine. But <laughs> and I, I'm so, like I said, I'm so glad that a client wasn't with us because that would have been just the most traumatic thing for this poor person who just wants to buy a house, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> although they could have talked down the price, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Well, that was kind so, of the concept of this show is that these are stigmatized right. properties and so yes. they do go for lesser prices yep. right. and we're trying right. to heal them so that they can be restored to market value. And that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so uh, where can people find more about you and your books? 
Well, I don't have a website anymore. I gave that up a while ago. I, I mean, if you want the books, like my, the, my latest one is How to Catch a Killer, which is 30 serial killers and all the various ways they've been caught. That just came out last month. Um, so that's, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any of those will, will have that. I'm on Facebook. I have three or four pages on Facebook. Haunted Crime Scenes is one of my pages. Um, uh, there's one for my name. There's one uh, fans of my uh, of me. Um, but I just, you know, I don't have the time to maintain websites, so you can't find me on a website <laughs> at this point. Facebook is the best place to get me, I think. Okay. Well, guys, um, if you want to check out her books, her name is Catherine Ramsland. Uh, like I said, 68 books and counting, I'm sure. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Miss Catherine, for joining us. It was a pleasure. I'm sure we would love to have you back another time. Like I said, talk about those 20 mis misnomers, you know. Uh, but it's it is time for our secret word of the week. So please text the word. And what time in this video we asked for it, along with your name, to 502-653-9528. And we'll choose a name and announce it on our Monday episode so we can get your address and mail you a gift. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for dishing up True Crime with the Good Wives and Miss Catherine Ramsland. Bye, guys.